Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to McDougal's Medicine with Dr. John and Mary McDougal. I'm your host and their daughter, Heather McDougal. I am very excited for tonight. I thought since we always have so many questions, it'd be nice to just get into general questions. So hi, mom and dad, Dr. McDougal and Mary, how are you? Nice to see you. Oh, good. I'm good. Yeah, we just had a really wonderful weekend, I'll tell you that. <laughs> it's been fun. Should we tell them why? <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> we had a lot of fun. We had to have the we had Heather's uh, two of her three boys up to visit us this weekend, and, and we had a lot of fun together. Kind of relaxed and built a big Lego thing, and yeah, had some good food. You know, so it was fun. And anyway, we're broadcasting to you from someplace in <laughs> on, someplace on the west coast. <laughs> uh, not sure we should identify where from. Anyway, Heather, I, 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 there's something I, I'd like to address. It came up in our um, discussion that we had. I don't know. Was it one of our one of our discussion sessions? I can't remember whether it was the alumni. It's not really important. Or maybe this group here. Uh, they asked me about adding oil to a salad, and I think they may even ask about the original article, which is to add avocado, add their avocado as a fruit, or avocado as oil to uh, the salad leaves and whether or not they increase the amount of carotenoids, you know, beta carotene and there are a whole bunch of just dozens oh, of yeah, carotenoids. Remember that question. Remember that question? Yeah. And I had remembered uh, writing an article about that many years ago. And I, I had to look into it because, well, it could be true. <laughs> I mean, adding avocado or oil to your salad could be could be increasing the amount of carotenoids. <clears throat> and I want to see if this is the case. Well, you increase the amount of carotenoids you get from your vegetables by curating them, by heating them, you know, mixing them up and so on and chomping them. You know, there are other <laughs> ways to it to do it, but you get this tremendous, I found a couple of papers, a couple of studies, and then we're gonna include them in the um, fat lecture that we're giving here, what, next weekend. Um, it's going to be part of the presentation I'm going to do on fats. And you'll have the references then if, if, because you're going to get all the slides. Uh, anyway, I, I looked it up and, and it's true. It's like, you know, it increases like eight times or 30 times and tremendous increase in the amount of carotenoids. And then I, I wondered, well, what is going on here? Because I believe, you know, one of my basic philosophies is that everything is done right in nature and, and the plants have to be put together correctly. And well, you are, shouldn't need fat to absorb all the right could there, could there be a problem there well you know adding the avocado and the avocado oil especially you're in a situation where the fat you eat is the fat you wear so you're going to find it more difficult to lose weight if you go into that philosophy and then my next thinking was well how many, how many carotenoids do we need i mean how much this stuff do we need and the answer is no more than is present in plants and we need no more fat than is naturally present in the plants to release the amount of carotenoids that we need so again, my basic belief that this is uh, the way nature did it perfectly. So, all right, so we're in a situation where if we add avocado, we have avocado oil, we increase the amount of carotenoids. And I started thinking about some original research that was done on beta carotene. And one of the major carotenoids that's released is beta carotene. And it was research that was done in the uh, 1990s where they had observed in the 70s and 80s, and as early back as maybe the 1960s, that there was an association between not getting cancer and eating more carotenoids. In other words, eating more vegetables. Carotenoids only come you know, from plants, not from any animals at all. So there was this observation worldwide that populations that eat the most carotenoids have the least breast cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer, et cetera. Well, the investigators went from that type of thinking to uh, to set up two experiments, two major experiments where they they took and they divided people at high risk for lung cancer into two groups. These would be smokers and asbestos workers. Divided them into two groups. They gave one group placebo and the other they gave them carotenoid receptors or car uh, car concentrated carotenoid supplements. Okay, so you had the supplements and they expected that the supplements giving these extra carotenoids would you know, without the having to eat all the vegetables would give that miraculous benefit of preventing cancer. They found just the opposite. They found that the risk of cancer in those that got the beta carotenoids was like 38% greater than the placebo group. 
So anyway, I started looking around you know, as, I, as I try and do in the scientific literature, and somebody else came to the same conclusion, is maybe it's not such a good idea to have these extra carotenoids being released by adding the avocado or adding the avocado oil. Maybe you're getting into a situation where you have this negative effect of, of, of a lot of carotenoids, maybe too many, setting up an imbalance that increases the risk of cancer. Well, you know, it's possible, but... Anyways, it doesn't convince me that you ought to be adding oil to your salads. Remember, the fat you eat the fat you wear. And, you know, the, my, my new concern is you may be on the negative side of keeping the systems in balance by doing this. So anyway, that's that's the best conclusion I've come <laughs> to right now. You choose. You can put avocado with your salad or not. You, you got well, plenty of carotenoids. You got, you got all the carotenoids you need, believe me. Anyway, and it's best to get our vitamins and minerals and fats in the food, right? In the natural packages, absolutely. Yeah. And nature did it right. I have to believe nature did it right. If it tastes good, you should eat it. What do you think of that? Well, no, that's, <laughs> that, that's not a good way. Not anymore. Yeah. Too many companies make things taste good because they want yeah, people to Yeah, but you know what they do? They took natural things that we like naturally that were to our advantage to survive, like the tip of our tongue tastes sugar, which is our fuel. And we have taste buds for starch on the tip of our tongue. And we have taste buds on the back of the tongue that are bitter and sour, which cause us to, to spit things out that may be medicinal or poisonous. So the taste buds have been designed for, I don't know, a long time, millions of years. And they're correct. Well, industry, of course, has taken advantage of these taste buds. And uh, there's also a taste bud on your on, on your. Uh, on your tongue for fat, but it's one where repulsion, if you could taste fat, you don't like it. So that one wasn't set up wrong either. It just seems like nature keeps doing everything right. But uh, anyway, if it tastes good, like <laughs> carbohydrate tastes good, oil tastes yucky. And one of the slides that I'm gonna give in this presentation coming up next Saturday is uh, a challenge to people. If you like oil so much, how about drinking a, a cupful? You know, I don't think many people Nobody would do that. Does that. Or even a tablespoon, a tablespoon of olive oil. Chuck, see if you can choke it down. I don't think so. They have, uh, they have to dunk something in it, like bread or something else. Yeah, to, to get the sugar along with it. Yeah. Anyway, we're going to have a lot of fun next Saturday. So. Yeah, I'll include the link in the chat for that event if anyone hasn't signed up that would like to. Okay, let's get to some questions. I've got a question from Janet. Some whole food plant-based doctors say that the thyroid needs selenium and a good source of selenium are Brazil nuts. It was suggested to me to add one Brazil nut every other day because my <laughs> selenium is low. I don't know. Um, very much. <laughs> See, what we need to do is you just set up an experiment where we have one group not take the Brazil nut every day and another group every take day. Every other day, okay. I mean, and, and another group take the Brazil nut every other day and then look at their thyroid function over a period of time. I doubt it. Who would eat, who would eat one Brazil nut every other day? Besides that, you know, <laughs> the, the, the Brazil, Brazil nuts were grown in the same ground that was the potato, that the corn. And there's selenium in the ground or there's not. There is. There's selenium in the ground and the plants take up the selenium as they do all minerals. Ladies and gentlemen, minerals are like little rocks. <laughs> They're in the ground. Uh, that's the way you need to look at it. And so hopefully you've got all the minerals you need in the ground where your food is grown. And it so is that way for people shopping in modern day supermarkets. So do you think they're basing the fact that um, where Brazil nut trees are, gr are growing? The soil would have more selenium in I, it. I don't think so. I think maybe they're just guessing that they have more selenium. Well, they probably measured. They probably okay, find. But why would the why would the Brazil not have more selenium if it wasn't growing? In maybe the they're hyperaccumulators of selenium. Oh, okay. I don't. I, I that's something I don't know. But I do know that uh, cruciferous vegetables, you know, cabbage and Brussels sprouts, uh, broccoli, those kinds of things. Uh, cruciferous vegetables are hyperaccumulators, but in addition to uh, selenium, which you know you may or may not need uh, more of, they uh, they hyperaccumulate cesium and thallium and things that cause cancer. So you got to be careful about wishing your plants were hyperaccumulators. You know we talked about this story in relationship to rice. You're all you're all upset about arsenic and rice. There's something, something so, so people think there's so, something so special about rice 
they're really, you know, maybe rice is a little bit better accumulating arsenic than other plants, but it's because the rice is grown on fields that used to grow cotton, which were infected with bull weevils, which were killed by the plantation workers by using arsenic on the bull weevils. But not all rice is grown on those kind of fields. No, there's not. In fact, you buy, you go make a little effort to buy rice. Yeah. That doesn't have arsenic, but don't stop eating rice, ladies and gentlemen. They've scared you half to death. And don't stop eating cruciferous vegetables. Don't stop eating cruciferous vegetables. Just hope that the farmers aren't farming your plants on contaminated soil. That's the problem. And uh, your best chance. And then that I wanted to mention something. I got I thank you for giving this opportunity. I looked up the arsenic content of pork. You know, you've got <laughs> to understand right. that here, okay. You know the the plants they accumulate arsenic from the soil. Well, what do you where do you think the plants go? Most of them they go to the to the pig pens, and and you know the animals eat this all this vegetable matter, and they hyper accumulate arsenic in their tissues. So you want to know the highest <laughs> amounts of arsenic and other other uh, heavy metals, poisonous metals, cancer causing metals. That you're going to get them in the animal foods. Does that make sense? You know you. You, you grow you grow the uh, the plants in dirty soil, and then you feed the plants to the pig or the cow, and then they because they eat like tons of this vegetable matter, all that arsenic and selenium and thallium and whatever all that stuff goes into their bodies, and they end up with the greatest concentration. But nobody mentions that; they just want you to be scared of rice. Well, you know, they feed the rice to the pigs and they feed the soybeans to the pigs and everything, probably leftover broccoli and all that stuff to the cows and pigs. But you know why they don't recommend uh, they don't you know, they never mention that pigs have high arsenic content. They don't. But I looked this up. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> okay. I was gonna give you the number. Maybe I will next time you know, we get together. But it's huge. Huge. So if you really want to buy arsenic, stop eating pigs and cows. <laughs> Anything else? Any any other animal that eats lots of vegetable matter that is contaminated with these heavy metals? Well, almost all animals eat vegetables, and almost all animals are eating foods the these days. That people eat. Yeah, they're they eating eat vegetables. They all do. They're all vegetarians. <laughs> Pigs. Uh, pig, pig is an omnivore. A true omnivore. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, cows no, are omnivore. Yeah, we we're, we have our intestinal tract is is as closest to a pig of any other animal that walks on four legs. Well, then, well, wouldn't that make us omnivores too? Yeah, I guess so. I guess, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Well, but, there, but anyway, I kind of blew that one tonight. Yeah. <laughs> you kind of did. Yeah, well, I don't know where I, where I remember that from, but I'm pretty sure that pigs have an intestinal tract like ours. So you can look that one up. Next we time like too. pigs. <laughs> yeah, we like pigs. We don't want to eat them. Yeah, anyway. Uh, okay. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next next question from Nicole. Is it healthy to eat potato and ve veggies for both lunch and dinner and lose weight? Or should I be worried about not getting enough nutrients? Well, I, I, you can live on potatoes alone. So, uh, you know, people do, people have. I, we recommend the kind of mono diets and to reduce variety to get broad results better and faster. Well, so she thinks that she ought to eat something different for lunch than she eats for dinner because she's worried that there won't be enough nutrients well, wait, wait. well what food, about like mary's mini we they eat the same thing over and over again for all three meals so no the the, the, the plants are, are complete you know they have the right amount of protein the right amount of vitamins the right amount of minerals and you know the proof of that is that well let's start with the animal kingdom uh, animals live, most animals live on a very monolithic diet. For example, koala bears. What do koala bears eat? Eucalyptus, please. All right, panda bears. Uh, bamboo? Bamboo shoots, okay. You see, uh, if you go down the line, what you find is every other animal uh, lives on a very, except for a pig. Yeah, except for a pig. That's how we're getting around to the pig uh, thing. Right. Because they really like pigs because <laughs> they'll eat anything, but they're not supposed to. We're designed more to eat. We're not supposed to eat like a pig. I know yeah. that's that's the bottom line. But if you think about it, just, just think about the, the the diet of animals that you've studied or lived with, or they eat the same thing every day. And it should be with you too, as I've tried to explain to you. Uh, underground storage organs, which are, are starches that grow underground. That's why they're called underground storage organs. 
uh, they're complete. They've got all the vitamins and minerals and except for B12. And if they're if you if you grow the potatoes and you don't shake off all the dirt and germs, then they got the B12 too. <clears throat> so anyway, they've got uh, the right amount of fat, the right amount of protein, vitamins, minerals, et cetera. Uh, you know, that for complete human nutrition. That's where people get confused. But why are you confused? Because you're supposed to think that you need each and every one of the 6,000 items sold in a grocery store. That's that's why you're told that. You know, and But if you stop and think about it, you know, if you look, just look at it. hundred years ago, there weren't 6,000 items in a grocery store. In a grocery store. That's true. Before 1980, 90% of the, of the food in China, 90% before 1980, this is well documented from China, it was white rice. And they grew into a population of big, strong, healthy people. Uh, they didn't have grocery stores. Well, they probably they did. Had they little had little shops. Markets, little markets where they sold a few things. Well, they didn't have the westernization of their country like they do now. Okay? Okay. Well, what I hear about China now is, you know, you see the Chinese. So the, when we were traveling a lot, I used to used to look at the people from China. Yeah. From the Asia, I was pretty sure I could identify some of them from China, and they were in they were in the great big airplane seats because they're <laughs> real big. So they've changed. Anyway, no, you don't have to worry about. It. In fact, there's some reason to eat a a repetitive diet it, you know, to expose your system to just a few things that has to make enzymes for and digestive processes for. So there's some real advantage to eating the same thing over and over again and having a very you know, repetitive diet as your system gets set up for digesting whatever's in the bulk of your food. And if you throw different foods at it all the time, it's got to invoke new digestive system and new ways of handling the nutrients. And it's a lot of work for your body. So, so no, it's easier on your body if you yeah, keep the same thing over, all over and over again. Yeah, keep it simple, yeah. You know, you don't, I know, and a lot of people will like this because, you know, people are very monotonous, Mary, in their eating. I, I know in our just immediate family, you know, we love the same things for yeah. breakfast. And we go to a restaurant and we, whatever restaurant we go to, we are the same thing off the menu. So this is, this is not, not a mistake. But again, variety will sell a lot of products in the supermarket. So that's why you're taught you need all this variety. Foods are varied enough. For over uh, for above ground storage organs, you need to add uh, fruits and vegetables because you need the vitamin A and C. Okay, but <clears throat> underground storage organs, the ones that grow underground, uh, they're complete. Above ground storage organs, which would be your your uh, your grains and your legumes, your beans, peas, and lentils. They need to have a little bit of A and C added to them, and that would amount to, say, um, a slice, a small slice of orange, a flower out of broccoli. That'll do it a day. Thank you. Next question from Ben. Uh, you talked previously about how uh, Alzheimer's and aluminum are linked. What about other forms of dementia? Oh, mm -hmm. let's see. The other for Parkinson's would be one, and, and that's due to pesticides organophosphates. You can look this up. Ladies and gentlemen, if you just take some of the things I'm telling you and you go to the Google or the National Library of Medicine, you say, well, Dr. McDougall just said something like Parkinson's, which is a, you know, something, a disease feared by you know, all of us. What, what you'll find is if you put in Parkinson's and organophosphates, or you can't remember how organophosphates, you put in Parkinson's and pesticides, you'll read for the rest of the week. You know, the, the information is overwhelming. So you've got Parkinson's due to the organophosphates. You've got Alzheimer's, which is due to aluminum poisoning. You've got alcoholism, which causes dementia, which is due to obviously alcohol. Uh, you've got little strokes in the brain, diffuse strokes, which are due to, you know, the basic high cholesterol, high fat animal products. It's really more complicated. That's It's a lack of starches, vegetables, and fruits and a, an abundance of, of animal foods. So you got these little tiny strokes and then you have big strokes. So you get, these are called vascular dementia, alcoholic dementia, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, 60 to 80% of the dementia. Uh, you become, when you, to diagnose dementia, <clears throat> it's just a matter of seeing somebody that's losing their, their abilities to learn and their memory uh, earlier in life than they should and more rapidly than they should. What about 
what about like real old age dementia? Like when you get to be 95 people, I mean, what that's must be due to some. Well, probably just, uh, you know, well, uh, that would be a little bit of all these poisons. Okay. In other words, like remember old mom. Yeah. So 106. Yeah. So in our clothes, 106. So not everybody, you know, naturally, ladies and gentlemen, naturally you're going to die and naturally you're going <laughs> to lose some of your abilities. You should get older. I mean, if you're 45, you can't perform as well as a 17 year old athlete. You're not, you're not going to win any of the events because you're old. You know, older. Oh, yeah. And you, when you get to be, when you get to be, you know, 75 and 76, like we are, I can't do what I did when I was 55. True. I'd like to. When I close my eyes, I wish I was. And sometimes I dream I am. <laughs> but it just doesn't happen. But what you want to do is you want to you want to slow the in inevitable as much as you can and preserve the youth and the vigor that you were given as a young person as long as you can. That's what we're trying to do. You're not, you're not going to beat the system, but you don't have to spend your time in a doctor's office. You don't have to spend your, you know, your, your latter years uh, in environments that you'd rather not be in, uh, like assisted living or memory units of an assisted That's living right. facility. You know, it's, it's just a matter of preserving things. So uh, you think I got the question answered, Heather? I think so. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think there's lots of causes of dementia and, and many of them are, are preventable. And, you know, I think we all want to do whatever we can to, to age gracefully, because like you said, we're all going to die, but we want to do it well. Yeah, you really do. You want and to we all have senior moments. I had senior, oh, yeah. I had senior moments when, I, you know, 15, 20 years ago, I had senior moments. <laughs> I think even teenagers have senior moments. <laughs> Probably. They're just called something different as we get older. <laughs> But you're not going to, I have to warn you, you're not going to be able to stop these by buying supplements such as Pravagen, which I they just drive me nuts, you know, advertising this product that's made of jellyfish and feel sorry for the jellyfish. You know, this stuff has been condemned by the AARP, been condemned by the FDA, by the medical letter. I mean, this stuff is nonsense, but you're buying it. You're spending $100 a month on these pills. And they're not the only one. They got all kinds of other brain supplements out there. Uh, why, Nareva is another new there's one. There's another one. Why? Why? Are they, why? Are they, because the bulk of the population is at an age where we're most concerned. We're not concerned about running a marathon. No. You know, we're pr pr concerned about losing losing, losing our, our mental, mental functions. Function. So you know, the marketers, the industries out there to to plague us that are getting older. And that's why you see all these supplements for, for your memory. And it's just nonsense. But the public beware, you know. Unfortunately, there are, there are scientists and organizations that have come out against these people, but they don't get the publicity that, that, that something like the people who, who market and sell Pravagen do. P-R-A-V-A-G-E-N, right? Yeah, yeah. P-R-E-V-A-G-E-N. Yeah, yeah whatever. -E -A. Uh, jellyfish. You know, jellyfish. jellyfish. Yeah. Thank so, you. Okay, next question. Oh, did you want to say more about that? I was just going to say you just got to keep the, the the blood flow going to the brain. You, you know, and you want to have clean blood. You don't want to have it full of pesticides and and uh, aluminum. You want to have the you know a clean body, clean blood, and just nourish the brain, and it'll last you pretty long. You know, I'm 75 years old. And I still remember a couple things. <laughs> We have, we, we listen. <laughs> That's probably enough. That's enough. I can't, I can't, I can't remember to stop talking. Right? <laughs> okay, next question. This is from V. What should I do for a slightly low hemoglobin and hemocrit since I went more whole food plant-based? Before, it was always low normal. Yeah. Well, when anybody who has a, a low hemoglobin or hematocrit, which, by the way, hemoglobin and hematocrit are pretty much the same. You know, one, I think, believe uh, hematocrit is about three times what your hemoglobin is. So uh, first thing you have to do when you have a low hemoglobin or hematocrit or low, low blood, red blood cells, you have to find out what the cause is. And any good doctor should approach it this way. You want to find out if you're bleeding. And the sources of bleeding that are mostly undetected are from the bowel, 
you know, you just don't, you don't notice in your stool unless you have really, really serious bleeding and then you have black tarry stools. But microscopic bleeding, it may notice it by a more of a dark tinge to the stool or probably don't notice at all unless you have a, a test for fecal blood, which you can get in the drugstore and you can test it. And causes of bleeding from the intestine are things like hemorrhoids and uh, gastric ulcers and diverticuli and colitis of various kinds. And the other thing is, is women lose blood every month when they menstruate. And uh, so that can be a significant loss of blood. And, you know, fortunately, as you probably expected to hear from me, is food is the answer to all of those in the sense that you get hemorrhoids from eating the Western diet and you get ulcers from eating the Western diet and you get colitis and diverticuli. And, you know, if you want to go through all the explanations for that, there's a, a lecture on GI disease that I, I've done many times. It's on our website. It always tells you how the Western diet causes these problems. As far as the menstrual loss, uh, that's due to the high estrogen levels that are created because you're eating the Western diet. And what happens, you overstimulate the endometrium, the inside lining of the uterus, and you grow too thick a lining every month, and you bleed heavy when you shed it, which is your period. And so you shed it, and, and you lose more blood, and you have uh, pain and clots and all kinds of things from eating the Western diet. And then fibroids. Fibroids also bleed. Then that's from stimulating the muscle of the uterus. Excess estrogen. I asked you about those the other day. Fibroids. Usually, right? right? Almost always. That's to one time with a, uh, a gynecologist. You know, I mentioned that. I mentioned that fibroids went away once you go through menopause. And we started talking about it. And I said, well, how many fibroids have you taken out or operated on or done hysterectomies for? And women that are 65, 70, 75, you couldn't remember one. Yeah. I said, what do you think happened to them? <laughs> You're doing them left and right in 40 and 50 year old women. Well, what would have, where, where did all these fibroids go? And, um, you know, and of course, if you, if you take hormone replacement therapy, um, you know, after menopause, then that's a, a big stimulation of the- So you could still get fibroids. You could still get fibroids, yeah, and bleeding and all kinds of stuff, which is a whole other story. You know, I do recommend hormone plate replacement therapy in some, a lot of circumstances. Great, thank you. Next question from Lydia. Is it possible to heal esophagitis without PPI meds? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, uh, esophagitis uh, is due to reflux, uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease. It's due to reflux because your lower esophageal sphincter, which is the muscular band that's between the esophagus and the stomach. And that muscular band is there so that uh, between meals, you don't have reflux. Okay, or when you lay down or stand on your head, you don't have reflux. So esophagitis, so just make right. Okay, clear. so it, so this irritation of the esophagus from the contents of the stomach, okay. refluxing okay. back up right. the esophagus. Right. So you got this incompetent sphincter, which is due to well, it's due to excessive straining. But again, that's in that GI lecture. So you got this sphincter that doesn't close, and so between meals you have. GERD, which is what mm -hmm. Nexium and Prilosec have inter educated you on, you have reflux back up to your esophagus or stomach contents. What's stomach contents? Well, the stomach is there to digest primarily meat and your meat. <laughs> and, and, you know, the stomach itself has a lining, a protective coating uh, that protects it from being digested by the acid in it. But the esophagus doesn't have this coating. So you reflux this acidic stomach contents with these digestive enzymes, which are there to digest meat, up back up the esophagus, you start digesting your esophagus and you get esophagitis. And when it gets really bad, we call it Barrett's esophagitis. And you know, it's believed for good reasons that this can turn into adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. You wanna talk about a bad disease, oh my goodness. You know, I've been in on several operations when I was a young doctor on, where you take and you cut the esophagus off and pull the stomach up into the throat and that, you know, you hopefully you they can eat after that. It's really a tough, tough thing to suffer. You don't want to go through that. Anyway, so that's how you get esophagitis. The answer to the question was, do you have to take PPIs? Well, two things I'm going to tell you there, if I remember. Uh, first of all, you raise the head of your bed, 
All right, the, the gravity at night keeps the acid in your stomach where it belongs. So it's not up there digesting your esophagus. You and start. It doesn't mean you use an adjustable bed. No, that it, means it's got to be like that. You use a four, four inch, four inch, like a two by four or a four by four, you know, or a brick under the bed. So you sleep at an angle, so gravity's uh, dragging it out. So that's that's the first thing you do. The second thing you do is you well, maybe not in that order, but let's just say in order of thinking about it, is you stop the things that make more acid in the stomach. Acid is there to digest meat, okay? Uh, also dairy. And uh, for example, we know this because cats who are obligate carnivores have seven times as much stomach acid as we do because we're not, <laughs> we're not carnivores. All right, so you stop eating, you stop eating the, uh, the meat. And by the way, the calcium in dairy also stops also causes acid secretion, okay? So you stop the dairy, you stop the meat, that reduces the acid secretion. You raise the head of your bed. And uh, you also be a little careful, as I know you're gonna remind me of, Heather. You also be a little careful with things that are, uh, in our on our diet, that's a little, hard, a little hard to digest, which are raw vegetables, raw vegetables, like onions, green peppers, cucumbers, and radishes. And uh, all right, so you've done all those things and you're still bothered. You still have burning sensation. You, you know, maybe you, you have repeat gastroscopes and the doctor keeps telling you that your esophagus is all red. So, so what, do you, what do you do next? Well, the next thing you do is you, you start taking wafer antacids like Tums. And then the next thing is you take H2 blockers like Tagamet. You buy these over the counter. And the last thing you do is you take proton pump inhibitors because they're very dangerous. What they do, and by the way, you can buy these in the grocery store. So it's not like they're unavailable to you. What they, what they do is they're called proton pump inhibitors. You make acid in your body. You know, the, just metabolic, just running the, running the muscles and stuff makes some acid. And that acid is supposed to be secreted, excreted, I don't know what the exact correct term is, but it's supposed to go from the bloodstream into the stomach where it does this digestive stuff. In that way, it leaves the body, the acid does. Well, if you have a proton pump inhibitor, so these pumps aren't working, you don't excrete the acid into the stomach. It stays in the body. So you've got this, this acidosis going on in your body. So your whole body's acidic. Well, how do you digest the food in your stomach if you don't get any acid in there to help digest it? It's, it's tough. You've got some. You've got enough. Okay. Yeah. But it's, it's, a, it's, it's a problem, Mary, because not only do you have this problem of acid, because you don't have enough acid in your stomach, uh, you don't kill bacteria that get in with the food. And so they have a high rate of, of pneumonia. Okay. So your, your point's correct. You're, you're, you're not doing the digestive stuff you should be doing. And one example is you have a higher rate of pneumonia, serious pneumonia, like the deadly kind of pneumonia. When you, run, when you uh, consume these proton pump inhibitors because you don't have the acid to kill the bacteria. All right, getting back to that acid. You got acid all over the body. Your, your systems become acidotic. So you have to neutralize the acid, the primary neutralizing part of the body. Every medical student learns this. I remember learning this in my freshman or sophomore year in medical school, the primary buffering system of the body is the bones. Was back 50, 50 some years ago, 55 years ago, <laughs> still is today, folks. The body's not changed. So the bones dissolve to release alkaline material, to neutralize this acid so that you stay alive. Well, dissolved bones lead to weak bones, which is called osteoporosis. And also those bones, they solidify in the kidneys, which results in the most common kind of kidney stone that people get on the Western diet, which is a calcium-based kidney stone. So you don't want to talk about proton hump pump. I, I have maybe when I was uh, seeing patients uh, at St. Lena Hospital or in our resort practice, when I, you know, I saw it like, I saw a lot, 6,000 people in that circumstance. Maybe, maybe one or two people a year I had to kind of give up on because they're having such a a severe esophagitis that, and I couldn't control it by the things that I said to you, but I do that. I finally gave in and I said, okay, take the proton pump inhibitors, but realize the, the risk you're taking, uh, you know, higher rate of fractures and higher risk of pneumonia and all kinds of problems created by these proteins. They're the last of the drugs you would want to use. 
So how do you get off them? You just stop them. That's how you get off them. And uh, what are the consequences? Just stopping them while the acid ingestion might come back. Well, you do the things that I just told you. Raise the head of the bed. Get the get the protein out of your food. You get the calcium out of your food. In other words, stop the meat and dairy. Uh, and then you you know you avoid the vegetable foods that are irritating. They're they're just irritating. They don't they don't cause any acid. Problems. What about hot things like kimchi and Sriracha hot sauce and yeah. things like that. Are they irritating? I have peppers. Yeah. Yeah. Are they yeah, they, yeah, they burn. Okay. They burn. But you know, Mary, if you do uh, gastroscopes and they do this in ulcer patients and they feed, you know, something hot Mexican cayenne pepper type stuff. Yeah. And you look at the healing, the healing is faster in those who are put on cayenne peppers compared to those who are, you know, who didn't get this particular treatment. So yes, it may give you a burning sensation, but it doesn't hurt the lining of the intestinal tract. Okay. But it hurts, it hurts from <laughs> here. You know, your small intestine has really no, uh, no sensation for the burning. But when you get down to the large intestine, particularly when you get down to your, the very, the very end of your large intestine, <laughs> those tissues, uh, the hemorrhoidal tissues are very sensitive and they burn from when you, when you, when you eat these uh, kind of peppers, uh, you know, the best example that I remember was when I was a sugar plantation doctor and we would have Korean patients come in to see me because they'd had a big night with kimchi and uh, they come in, they uh, were waving their hand across their buttocks and saying, when's this burning going to stop doc? <laughs> Don't you have a pill to stop this burning? I say, no, just stop eating the kimchi. It'll go away in a little, little while, short time. Okay, <laughs> onward. <laughs> Enough. Thank you. That was great. Lot, lots of ideas for, for healing there. Uh, okay, next question from Fitness Beyond 30. Is it okay for marathon runners or those doing heavy exercise to eat a higher fat diet? No. Plant foods, of course. Not if, not if you want to win. I mean, look, who just won the marathon? It was just, was it New York Marathon again last yeah. week? Yeah. It was, it was Kenyans again. Kenyan. You know, if you want to be at the front of the pack, no, you shouldn't eat these things. Um, you need, you, you know, every time, every time you eat fat, you are replacing carbohydrate. So if you eat high fat foods, you know, they could have been high carbohydrate foods. And you've known as a runner forever that you need to carbohydrate load. So if you're eating fatty vegetable foods, these are full of fat. And you could have been eating carbohydrate, which gives you the long-term energy. So fats from vegetables are going to be a lousy energy source. You need the, you need the carbohydrates. You need to eat what, what winners always eat. You know, I, I can't think of, the, of a marathon in the last 10 years that wasn't won by an Ethiopian or Kenyan. 80% of their diet is, uh, is corn. It's a corn porridge called Ugali. And they're always very trim. Oh, God. Yeah. You know, and, and you look at them and they are so trim and so fit. And you think, how could somebody so thin like that be so good at running this marathon? Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? You know, being bulky like a weightlifter is not necessarily the best condition you could be in. No. Well, uh, I think a big bulky weightlifter would probably have trouble running 26 miles. They, yeah, they, they probably <laughs> carry around all those muscles. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Next question. This is from John. What is your opinion on parboiled rice? Would you consider it brown rice? Go ahead, Mary. You tell me that. Parboiled rice is just pre-cooked rice. So I mean, you can parboil white rice. You can par parboil brown rice. So it, it um, if it's sold as parboiled rice, it, it can be either brown or white. So it just all it does is make the cooking time a little bit less because it's already been cooked once. And then dried, so it's like it's like minute rice. It cooks faster, so it, it can yeah. be. Yeah, I didn't know that. Well, see, that's why I'm here. I guess that's why you're here. Well, you're here to keep me <laughs> keep me in line. That's why you're here. I don't think you're doing a very good job that tonight. <laughs> you guys are great. Okay, next question: Why do we get mouth sores? Is it a sign of poor health? Yeah, that's a good one. You know, I. I, I really haven't. That's one of those things that's kind of stumped me over the years, uh, Heather. I've, uh, you know, I think uh, some of these are due to allergic reactions. And, you know, 
which would be even autoimmune diseases that severe. You know, the autoimmune diseases that attack the bowel, they attack the bowel all the way from the mouth to the very bitter end. And so you could have a minor form of autoimmune disease, uh, you know, not like ulcerative colitis, et cetera, or you could have a really minor allergy to something such as, well, I, I used to blame citrus fruits, you know, oranges and lemons and grapefruits and things like that. But, you know, with, with that kind of recommendation to people, I haven't really seen a lot of results. So uh, I can tell you one thing that we've uh, anecdotally discovered, uh, and it's just because somebody told us this and, and it's worked, it out. worked out for one person. It worked out for one person, but really well. And, and uh, repetitively, go ahead, Mary. You tell them what it was. Uh, well, it was, it was someone that, that we knew that we, that complained about mouth sores all the time. And so um, just happened to discover on their own that if they used um, Listerine, the blue Listerine, not the yellow Listerine. So there must be something in the blue Listerine that's different. And used that Listerine as a mouthwash the, the mouth sores that they went away and didn't come back. There you go. So, you know, it's, it's a, a test result of one person. Give it a try. It's not going to do you any harm at all. Otherwise, I don't have a good answer for you, except that, you know, if it's really troublesome, I would eat as simple a diet as possible. I would look to the, the discussion of an elimination diet. If you're really going to sort this out, I don't know how troubling they are for you. It's just an occasional canker sore or, uh, you know, occasional you bite your lip. Yeah, that happens a lot. You yeah. bite your cheek or your lip and and uh, you get a sore. Well, the person that we're talking about had them all the time. Oh, oh Just, it destroyed their life. Yeah. You know, and they found that that mouthwash helped. I'll tell you something else anecdotally that uh, I've, I've seen help is when you do bite your mouth. Oh, I, yeah. I, sh I shouldn't probably, I probably get into trouble for telling you this. Probably. But I'll tell you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's neosporin ointment. Yeah. I know that's not a standard recommendation. There's probably not a good idea eating neosporin, except it's one of the antibiotics that we give orally a lot. But uh, neosporin ointment, if you've taken bite your lip, you put a little bit of that on. I, it has been, you know, my experience and experience with other people I've talked to is that it, it that, that injury from the bite doesn't turn into this very painful ulcer. Uh, you you won't want to learn that anyplace else but here, folks. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, next question. You talk a lot about not ingesting oils. What about putting creams and lotions on our skin? Is that okay? And is there anything you recommend? Well, let's see. I recommend that you attend the lecture this Saturday because we're going to talk. About, <laughs> we're going to talk about. We're, I'll tell you what I'm going to tell you. What I'm going to explain to you is that. Um, there, there are situations you run into in the medical business where people, their intestinal tract is isolated, it's not working, it's so damaged that it doesn't do any good at all. So they can't be fed by mouth. They have to be fed intravenously. It's called hyperalimentation. And for hyperalimentation, you can give all the vitamins and minerals and proteins and carbohydrates through this, this IV needle, okay? But you can't give fat because you know the fat separates from the water. So you can't give the fat. So uh, what happened is these people have developed fatty acid deficiency, which is manifested by uh, sores in the side of their mouth uh, and, and dry skin and a whole, a whole bunch of rather, I'm not gonna say they were mild things. They were very troublesome to these people, but you know, not like having a heart attack, but there's mostly skin problems that they have. Anyway, the, the way we treated it and still do today, as far as I'm aware, is they would take safflower oil and they would just put it on the skin, on the forearm, and that's it. Just a little safflower oil on the skin for a couple of days. And, and that was enough fat to, to meet all the, the fatty acid needs and all the essential fats is, is adding a little safflower oil to the skin. So in answer to your question, is the oils that you put on your skin, they go someplace. You know, they, they, you, unless you wipe them off with a towel, they go into the body. And do I think that it causes obesity? Not, probably not. I don't, I can't, I wouldn't worry about it from that point of viewpoint. I, I can't no, think. I, of, use, I use skin cream. I'm not, I'm not worried that I'm taking in too much fat. I use yeah. skin cream to keep my skin soft. Good. So, you know, 
I guess I would just recommend that you use a good natural skin cream that's not tested on animals. <clears throat> All right. Yeah, me, me too. I don't, I don't know what I do without my creams and lotions. So, okay, thank you. Uh, let's see. Next question. Um, uh, okay, let's see. Is it true that long distance running damages the heart? This question's from Yukon Noka. Well, I don't think long distance running uh, prevents dying of heart disease. And this was proven by uh, James Fix, who wrote the runner's handbook. Uh, he said that you'd never die of a heart attack if you complete a marathon. <laughs> and he died at 56 of a heart attack. And the, the graveyards are full of people who took this attitude. I can eat anything I want. All I have to do is be able to run a marathon. So it's not protective. Does it do damage to the heart? Well, it causes the heart to be enlarged. Uh, it slows the heart rate. And I don't think this is a, a damage uh, so, you know, in, if you're careful and you do, you know, you build up and you do moderate amount of running, like I've never heard of anybody being damaged except to believe that it's makes you immune from a heart oh. attack. Okay. Jack Scaff was another one, one of my, yeah. one of my enemies in Hawaii, <laughs> Jack Scaff, yeah, who is a character, he set up the Honolulu Marathon and he and I, we used to have public discussions back when I lived in Hawaii. He, and did, he did not like a starch-based diet. He, he ate, he, he ate solid meat, and yeah. he's 10 years older than I am, but he's a pretty sick guy these days. You know, he's... he's still I, thought, I thought he wasn't around anymore. No, he's still alive. I read an article, oh, newspaper okay. article about him. Jack Scaff is, you can look it up, a Honolulu advertiser. Just Jack, know that you can eat almost anything you want. He's still alive. Like he's still to be he's alive. Been, he's got horrible illnesses, Mary. I think he's confined to a wheelchair. He's, you know, I mean, the story was not a... Not a favorable one, but then I said he's 10 years older than I am. I mean, no. I don't know what's going to happen to me in the next 10 years. Sure. But I can tell you that you know, when he was my age, I was in a heck of a lot better health than he was. <laughs> Jack Scaff is his name. I set up the Honolulu Marathon. Another example of you're not immune if you can run a marathon. So I don't know that I gave a, a, an adequate answer, but I don't know. I haven't heard of, heard of anybody working hard. Uh, if you take testosterone, to build up your muscles, if, if if that's one of the one of the uh, one of the things that's part of your program is to take testosterone creams or shots or ointments, you have a dramatic increased risk of dying of heart disease. So you know, and of course, I associate you know, uh, uh, people who are interested in well bodybuilding for sure. Well, you see ads for that all the time on TV too, yeah. um, for bodybuilders and for. Um, improving your uh, strength, uh, muscular strength and endurance and those kind of things. Those are don't, 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 don't take testosterone. It doesn't, it doesn't increase your libido. Okay. Of course, that's why they're selling it to you. You're never going to feel like you did when you were 17. <laughs> and, uh, it, it, you know, you run a, a considerable risk of, of having a heart attack and a lot of other problems too. It's not the way to go. It's normal for a man as he ages to have decreased testosterone, just like it's normal for you ladies to go through a menopause around age, around age 48. It's normal for a man. We won't, we won't get into that kind of discussion, how they build no, men no, and women. Probably not. But maybe that's why older men start young families. Oh, well, maybe. Yeah. You have to do that with a young bride, Mary. Okay. Enough. Okay, next question. Moving on. <laughs> uh, okay, I've got this is a good one. Um, this is from Jean at a monthly Western Neuropathy Association support group. Two women were talking about how a vegan diet could reduce nerve pain, but yeah. didn't provide any details. Can you give us some insight on on that? Well, uh, Neil Bernard, who's one of my colleagues, has written a, a whole book on how a high carbohydrate diet uh is is a in itself a painkiller so you know for one thing you're you're getting rid of a lot of the things that cause arthritis and and uh, muscular pain and pain in your tendons and so all kinds of things when you switch to a healthy diet which is eating lots of carbohydrates and plus the carbohydrates when you eat a high starch diet you increase the amount of serotonin in your nervous system and that blocks some of the pain sensations so Look up Neil Bernard's work about, about eating right and it's based on our diet. 
Uh, Neil Bernard is the head of P PCRM, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. Very famous group. If you don't know him, you need to know him. Get to know him. Get to, get to know Neil. Uh, he and I have been, you know, personal, professional friends for, well, for probably 45 years. He does good work. And he wrote a whole book on pain and, and how you get relief of pain from eating a healthy diet. Thank you. Our next question from Jennifer. What are the benefits and differences between an infrared sauna versus traditional home unit saunas? And do you recommend them for help with inflammation? Uh, you got me on that one. I don't, <laughs> I don't know enough to give you a good answer on that. I don't know the difference between an infrared sauna and a heat sauna. Well, I don't know. I mean, we, used you know, to go, we used to go in both. You know, when we, I remember going in a heat sauna that they, you know, the steam would come from rocks and it would be really hot in there, but I don't really know about infrared. Uh, you have know? To... Have I you don't been... know. The infrared, I haven't either. Sounds like a lot, like it's an enjoyable experience. But whether or not it helps you be healthier, uh, there's, you know, there hyperthermia is a treatment that's been used uh, Agatha Thrash used to use it at Uchi Pines, which was a program in Georgia, which was, uh, you know, uh, running when I was when I was a young a young man. You have to explain what hyperthermia is. Hyperthermia is where you raise the body temperature, and you would do it by uh, well. In fact, when I first went to Saint Lena Hospital, we had Saint Lena Hospital is where I worked when I moved to California back between. Uh, 1986 and 2002. It's an Adventist hospital. And so they took a lot of the Adventist treatments, you know, Ellen White, vegetarian diet, they used all kinds of different things. Well, they had a hyperthermia unit at the hospital when I first went there. And Agatha Thrash, who ran Uchi Pines, used to use hyperthermia too. And she would take people with serious autoimmune diseases and raise their body temperature. Oh, okay. And 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 help them get over these problems. And it worked. Well, she claims so. Okay. And, and they they seem to think so for a long time. But let me carry it even further. There's uh, and you can look this up. You know, I'm sure it's still an active pursuit by researchers, is to raise the body temperature to treat cancer. Oh there, yeah. There, yeah. There, there are there are okay. big big organizations, big major hospitals all across the world, where they use hyperthermia. They heat the body. Mm -hmm. Well, the whole idea is to is to simulate a fever, but see what happens with a fever is much more than the body temperature going up. A whole bunch of uh, immune reactions take place in the body that are unrelated to the temperature. The temperature is just one thing. But that's what they're trying to. That's what they're trying to simulate. Yeah, right. Is the immune reaction. So hyperthermia, I think, is something that could should be reinvestigated. And probably included in therapies for people who have, you know, well, let's see. I'm trying to think of what they were used to treat with that. Uh, Lyme disease. Well, that's what I was going to say, Mary. <laughs> okay. Well, let me let me know. Let me. I think the reason you associate with it is because of our good friend Henry Heimlich. Yeah. See, we were getting into a whole bunch of topics, but why not? We've had that kind of <laughs> so far. Henry Heimlich is uh, was a, a good friend of mine, personal and. Uh, and professional friend. Henry Heimlich saved more lives than any person who walked on this earth, you know, the Heimlich maneuver. There's also something called the Heimlich chest valve. And by the way, I wrote a whole newsletter on Henry Heimlich. You'll find it on our website. So if you want to know more details, more accurately presented, you'll, you can read about Henry Heimlich. Well, so Henry Heimlich has saved more people than anyone else has walked this planet with the Heimlich maneuver and the Heimlich chest tube. Okay, go on to the rest of it now. Okay, so Henry Heimlich decided that <laughs> uh, it was in the 80s. And again, we were good friends. He decided to, what he was going to do is he was going to use uh, malaria therapy. Okay, you can look this up, malaria therapy. And the reason he decided he was going to use malaria therapy to treat Lyme disease, chronic severe Lyme disease, is because Lyme disease is caused by a spirochete. Back in the 1930s, there, the, uh, this man received the Nobel Prize for his work. What he did is he used uh, malaria, which raises not just the body temperature. You get the infection with malaria. I mean, all the immune factors are, are, are invoked. Okay, so what they did is they cured tertiary syphilis. That means syphilis is in the bone, the brains, et cetera. Not, not, not amenable to just plain old penicillin. 
So they uh, introduced malaria therapy, which is a curable form of the parasite malaria. And it raised the body temperature and it cured, I think it was like the cure rate was near 100%. And the harm was zero, but the profit was zero too. And there was a whole bunch of competition from the drug companies for antibiotics and hospitalizations, et cetera, that really pushed this whole therapy out. Anyways, Henry Heimlich said that what he's going to do is he's going to try to start treating Lyme disease. And this is when he was a friend of ours, Mary, when he's still alive. He started treating Lyme disease and he you know, published some of his work. And uh, anyway, that, that, that's the, the, along the whole line of radius in the body temperature. And if you want to know my thoughts about it carrying on is that I believe they ought to reintroduce this as a treatment, infecting people with malaria, not just for certain chronic infections, but also for cancer. He started a study in China uh, with a group that had people who had cancer and he gave them malaria to invoke an immune response, which would cure the cancers. There are a lot of some ways that should be tried, which invoke the body's natural abilities. And that's what these new drugs that are coming out are trying to do. Is to trying to, but you know, you could you could cause this to happen by simple things like giving people a curable form of the parasite malaria. But he wasn't allowed to do it in the United States. Well, he got a lot of a lot of grief for it. Yeah. Uh, I don't think anybody officially stopped him, okay. but he couldn't get the support he needed, the financial support. But he was, uh, you know, they had the Heimlich department. I believe it was in uh, in Cleveland. Yeah, his, his offices are. You ought to learn about it, Dr. Henry Heimlich, an amazing man. And um, anyway, when Henry, I'll end by telling <laughs> you this. When Henry Heimlich got sick, he came to my program to get well. And he got sick when he was in his 70s, and he lived to be near 90 plus. Oh. Yeah. But, uh, you know, one of the greatest honors in my life is that the man who, who, who saved more lives than anybody else, when he got sick, he came to me for help. Yeah. Yeah, I remember he came to our house for dinner a couple of times. Yeah. 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 And he came to one of our advanced study weekends. Yeah, stayed it stayed with us. He was one of my yeah. my patients. Anyway, a man who didn't get enough credit. Definitely not. Uh, okay, let's see. We've got a couple minutes. Let's get in one more quick question. This is from Mr. Ross Michael. Are there any benefits to consuming ground flax seeds? Well, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I don't think there's any serious harms for it until you start separating the flaxseed from the oil. Uh, and, and again, in preparation for this talk I'm going to give on Saturday, this coming Saturday, uh, I talk about how in these animal experiments, and I know some of you have object to, objection to hurting animals, and I understand that. But they were, uh, by feeding flaxseed oil, to these experimental animals, they increased the volume of the tumors compared to a low fat diet by a thousand fold. But he's not talking about flaxseed oil, he's talking about ground flaxseed. I know, but you go from the whole flaxseed, which is barely digestible, yeah. you start grinding it, you know, right. that's some of the processing. So I, I would think it would add body weight to you and well, it yeah. might have some negative effects. Um, I don't know. But I, you don't use you know, too much of it. I would be. I would not treat it things. as a big part of my diet. Yeah. It, it when you when you grind it, you expose the body to more of its uh, its raw fats and uh, more risk of suppressing the the cancer fighting part of the immune system. Well, I bet you're going to talk a lot about that on your in your fat like shrine. Oh, Saturday. <laughs> yeah, we're Next gonna, Saturday, we're going to have a. I got a lot of work to do between now and that. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty close. We're going to talk I about. Look forward to it. Anyways, it's, it's a series of lectures that I've, Heather and I put together for, uh, we did the first one on protein about 10 days ago, and we're doing the one on fats in a few days, and then we're doing one on carbohydrates and one on vitamins and minerals, and then I'm I'm done with what I've learned about human nutrition over the last 46 years. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> no, no I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat the things I've learned about medicine. Yeah, but you always find out new things. You know, I, I got a, a question from a friend. I don't know whether we have, I won't put a lot of time in this. They ask you, you know, why Why do you think there are so many people that object to or believe otherwise to what you say and you discount their viewpoint? For example, she was talking about somebody who recommended you eat all these oils mm -hmm. to, for good health. And there are a lot of people out there. 
And the answer is, is that, you know, my, my viewpoint includes the patient. I, I look at the ultimate outcome of the patient. The people you're talking to are, you know, their medical training is limited to say the least. They're not doctors. I'm a practicing physician. And, uh, you know, I have an ultimate goal to keep my patients healthy. I don't need to just see biochemical changes that take place in a laboratory. And that's why I think that the opinion that I have to offer should be listened to us because you've got, you know, half a century of experience uh, being a medical doctor who, you know, worked in an office, talking to people, listening to people, touching people and thinking about, well, okay, I might help this, but what's going to happen over here if I, and anyway, that's why I think I deserve your ear, your attention. <laughs> All right. Well, we've run out of time. It's six o'clock. That was Ooh, fun. I'm glad, I'm glad of that. <laughs> you better tell people that. She will. Well, we'll we'll see. We'll see you all next Sunday. No, no, not next Sunday. Is it next Maybe, Sunday? Yeah, we'll be here next Sunday. It's the following Sunday that we'll miss because of Thanksgiving. But we'll see you all next Sunday at five. And next Saturday, he's giving us that lecture. And just to remind people, when's your next twelve-day program where we? you know, get 90% of the people to reduce or stop their medications and get you on the right track. January 13th. All right. So okay. thanks. Thanks for paying attention to us this evening. Thanks, everyone. It's great yeah, seeing you all. Thanks, Mom and Dad. I heard just a lot of things for you to look up. <laughs> and I'll give you a test on it next week. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. We look forward to it. Thanks, all everyone. Right. See you all next Sunday at 5 p.m. Pacific. Bye. Bye.